would seem to, to cut the trolls off at the knees, but respect robust discussion. I'd just like to, I agree with what's being said. I'd just mm. like to say my experience and how trolls have modified my whole life. Um, back in 1996, I proposed putting, internet, uh, putting Radio New Zealand and BBC World on the internet as a streaming system. As soon as, and I funded it and I built it, and Radio New Zealand didn't contribute any money to that. And as soon as it went up, I was attacked both inside mainstream media because they didn't feel like anybody else had been involved, and also privately uh, through lots of different means that were going on. And my, I initially started to engage with them, and then I followed the do not feed the troll yep. policy. And I got absolutely no support from the institutions who um, I was helping to represent. Later, before this, in 1993, 1991, I commenced development of a mobile communication system which led to a patent in New Zealand and a patent in the United States, which I, Michael S. Sutton, sued Nokia up to the Court of Appeal in Texas. And I have never given any public interviews to any mainstream newspaper or media here, although my partner is chief reporter of Radio New Zealand. Hmm. This whole business of trolling has affected my ability to tell you, the public, about what has gone on in the patent world. And mine was an embedded software patent, and I work with Catalyst on various open mm -hmm. source projects at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you that the harm that these people do is that I choose actively not to discuss situations which are actually of incredible moment, Trans-Pacific Partnership moment, mm -hmm. you know, activities in which I feel that even my own government has betrayed me, right? And I cannot talk, to, because I believe that as soon as I do that, I'm going to be open to this sort of, you know, stuff, having experienced it before. So, mm, you know, I'm, okay. I, I really understand what other people go through, but I've made this active decision not to explain myself until such time as the videos, the documentaries, the films, the books come out. Come out, okay. Can anyone relate to that experience? Anna. Anna's, Anna Sandiford's one of our side bloggers, forensic scientist. Um, yeah, I've had um, a similar experience to you, is I am very careful about what I choose to talk about uh, because I get involved in quite high profile criminal cases and the perception is that I am there to basically um, assist one side or the other achieve whatever their goal is, whereas the actual role of a forensic scientist is to help the court decide what the final outcome is. Now I see um, many court cases, some of which we're involved in, some of which we're not. Um, I see them being reported in the media, and I know there are fundamental issues that are wrong, but it's not something that I've chosen to comment on because I've been caught by this in the past in mm. another case where the online vitriol has been quite staggering, mm. not something that I'd ever imagined would happen, and other people have actually sued um, these people for defamation as a result of that, and I've been kind of a, a sideline to that. And so I avoid it, same as you, which means that the blogs that I do aren't necessarily as exciting as they mm. could be. And I know people would like to hear a bit more about the science of some of these cases, but I've chosen not to. Maybe when I retire and I can't be annihilated professionally in mm. a witness box, I will do it. But until then, I have to be careful about what I say. Okay. So. Comment there in the second row. Yeah, good day. Um, <laughs> so my experience with uh, trolling is a bit different. I make uh, YouTube videos Ooh. And, um, Ooh. Yeah. and it's kind of like a widely known fact that if you put anything up on YouTube you're going to get extreme trolling. Mm. But it's um, a lot of the time it doesn't actually mean anything. Yeah. Like you guys are talking about how the, the trolls are trying to make a point or they have an actual viewpoint. But a lot of the time it's just it's want to see the world burn. And, yeah. you know, just take the piss. And there's a lot of the, like there's a huge amount of humour everywhere, which it, it's all a lot of it is kind of based on. So, um, as you were saying before, like you would have websites where you, people would be like saying, "Ha ha, I went to this place and I trolled and it was hilarious," and that's that's quite a big uh, culture, especially on you know, like huge websites, um, you know, like Reddit, for example, and stuff. You always see posts about people going to really well-known, um, you know, religious websites or whatever and just trolling. Yeah. And it's just a it's just a big joke to a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. 
And, you know, if you look at Facebook, for instance, Campbell Live and Close Up have really taken to Facebook. And it's hugely successful for them. Campbell Live put up just a couple of nights ago, have you considered moving to Australia for a better life? It was a piece they were running. 325 comments, over 400 likes. So there's a lot of engagement on this stuff. Close Up, dolphins or jobs about the Maui's dolphin. 250 comments. And it's quite hard to moderate on Facebook because you can't put it in a queue and, and, and moderate it that way. It basically goes straight up and you can delete comments. But I'm interested in your views on how the mainstream media are getting to grips with these new, really interactive forums like Facebook. And also, I know there's guys down the back there who run blogging networks and websites, and there'll be other people who run blogs. What is working most effectively for you guys? And Chris, particularly, I want to get to the point about anonymous comments, which have led some people like Rod Drury from Zero to not comment on the MBR website because they think it's just there's too many people trolling. Any comments from David Farrar or, or Chris or anyone else down here? Kia ora, Joel Pauling. Um, I'm going to kind of segue back into some of the stuff that was talked about before. Um, look, <laughs> trolling is, is, is interesting because it's become this kind of term, and I think this echoes back to what Dean was saying, it's become this catch-all term for any sort of criticism. Uh, if you're posting a comment online, it's, it's bec and it's, it's contrary to a positivist attitude, it's, it's seen as trolling or as disruptive. Um, I see this in corporate slide packs for how to deal with social media. I see a flowchart from the US military about how to deal with comments made on social me uh, media. And it's basically, is it positively reflecting the organization? No, shut it down. And that is just a ridiculous um, totally. proposition to make. I, it, I, as a psychologist, this is an interesting thing to watch because when I, when I finished my academic career in 2008, this was only just starting to make inroads into sort of the mainstream psychology journals. Mm. And for me personally, this is something that's obviously been an important issue as, a, as an early adopter um, right through my academic career. So sort of sideline journals like the Journal of Communi Mediated Communication, we've been looking at this for quite a long time, but something like the British Journal of Social Psychology has only just starting to see articles. And the thing is, is this is just antisocial behaviour. It's just a, it's just a new way of, of seeing it. And, and um, someone made the comment the other day is that the, the difference between this and, and previous antisocial behaviour and conversations is that we have a record of it, which yeah. makes us more incensed because we can go back and reread it and over and over again. And we spend more time thinking about it. And any anyone who has any sort of idea of social psychology knows that think about something, you'll, you'll make up more ideas, it'll take up more time in your head, mm -hmm. and you'll get more angry or, or more, more emotional about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, it, I think we need to stop calling it trolling. I mean, okay. I think if there's one thing that I can kind of suggest, stop calling it trolling. Look at the cases individually. Okay. Uh, it's the um, best of David? advising. David? Can I say something? I'm going to jump in. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally with you, and um, there's a comment um, on the Twitter stream um, from Sean someone or other saying, Trolling scene is these people, the other is us, surely. Um, we can't transform the enemy, we can engage our disagreeing partners. And I think there's a, there's, a, um, there's a level in New Zealand where we're quite immature in terms of um, our perception about what engagement actually is. Mm. And very rapidly, if someone um, has a dissenting opinion, they're a troll. And I, um, I'm seeing this as um, Trolls Anonymous, my name's Ben, and, and, and I've been accused of being a troll. You know, I've made the mistake, um, unlike the two people here are coming out and saying, you know, espousing my opinion, be it about, um, you know, Pacific Fiber or or, or um, uh, heaven forbid, um, zero, <laughs> and, and all of a sudden you call the troll. Um, yeah. Having an opinion isn't, isn't trolling. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I, I think, I, I, I can really say that I'm, I'm calling for our leaders here, and I'm not talking political leaders, I'm talking people that have some influence. To actually get a little bit mature about yeah. what is considered a troll. If someone expressing an opinion, regardless of whether it agrees or disagrees with your perspective, isn't trolling, it's not expressing an opinion. Right. And we should stand up and, and, and commend anyone for actually doing that, anonymously or otherwise. And if they do it anonymously, chances are it's because they've seen other people get crucified for, for doing it on the record. Right. Yep. Yeah. There's, there was an article and stuff the other day by, by someone who was reported as being a psychologist. Turns out they were a marriage counsellor. But it was a really long article, and, and this is another thing. Is I think because it's becoming more mainstream, we're seeing yeah. social media become, going into more things. 
uh, across the board in more industry, more different topics. Um, people who traditionally haven't been involved are getting involved in applying traditional models of uh, maybe relationship counselling to, to online forums, which is just completely insane. Mm. Um, so, and that goes back to what you're saying. You need to become more sophisticated about the way we deal with this. Pass down to David there. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Peter. In terms of what is that awful term, trolling as opposed to anything else, the litmus test I tend to apply as a hard one because it comes to intent is, is the intent to disrupt or to debate? Yeah. I'll be quite tolerant of debate with quite aggressive, strong passions and words, but there is a difference between that and someone who, who wants just to turn a discussion thread into a, uh, a flame war. As a personal policy, I will try to never go into a discussion thread more than three times. I believe if you can't make your point in three goes, right. you won't. You'll convince anyone who's open to persuasion after that has become a flame war. And the problem tends to be when two people start to go hammer and tongs. The real difficult issue I struggle with is uh, people who are nominous. One part of me strongly defends people's right to be anonymous on the internet. I see I've got around 7,000 people registered on Kiwi Blog, and there's some people there with very good reason to be anonymous. Mm. Um, they may be related to MPs, they may work in the public service, etc. Um, but having said that, by far the worst um, abuse comes from people who are not posting under their actual name. Right. I think there's a great moderating impact when you actually are saying, I'm going to be searchable and discoverable for these words in the future. And how much moderating are you doing on a daily basis of that type of thing? Um, well, it's very much complaint driven. And interestingly, there's far fewer complaints in the last six months, but I think that's more, there's almost a bit of a fatigue. It could be that people have sort of just accepted yep. um, a certain amount there. What I am starting to think about is whether to have a two-tier policy when it comes to people's names. That current policy is you can use a fake name and alias, and I have a demerit system where, but like with traffic cops and speeding, um, you get somewhere from 10 to 100 demerits. If you get to 100, you're suspended for a week. <laughs> Make it again, suspended for a fortnight, month, two months. And the idea that possibly being, if you manage to get suspended twice, then if you want to get re-registered, it must be under your actual name. Yeah. So those who want to be anonymous but don't use it for, um, I'll use the term, trolling can still do so. Mm -hmm. But those who want to just um, try and destroy the discussion forum, yeah. if they have a consistent record of doing that, then they won't be able to keep using an alias. Having said that, there are one or two people um, who do post under their real name and are probably amongst the worst people worst there, so well. don't think that's a universal cure. Okay, let's just go along the table just quickly to Chris Keel from National Business Review, uh, digital editor on anonymous uh, posts. Hi, oh, yeah. um, I first just want to say that NBR doesn't <coughs> tolerate um, posts that are mindlessly um, abusive or defamatory. We have a, a full-time sub-editor who um, deletes multiple posts a day and we have a, a report function um, on, on the um, site that we've recently added um, for people who want to alert um, us to any comments that Wayne Butler, who is our new um, full-time chief sub-editor moderating comments, has missed. Um, however, our publisher is very much committed to maintaining anonymous comments. Um, he says it is essential to, to free speech and particularly um, in the area of whistleblowing. Um, and if you're going to have whistleblowers, which is really important to our democracy, mm. you've got to have a comment system that people believe is truly anonymous and that means um, no registration. Um, if you see on our site today, there's a story about a whistleblower at Housing New Zealand, and from an anonymous comment, we got a really good tip about how Zero had changed the way it 
reported its own accounts, which had a big impact on shareholders. Um, that's just a couple of stories that wouldn't have happened um, if we got, if we had, um, everyone had to register for comments. Mm. Um, it, it's always better when people do leave their actual name. We're trying to encourage that. We're going to introduce um, a verified comment system soon, which we hope will will further that. But um, overall, it's NBR's publisher's very um, strong view that you've got to take the crunchy with the smooth to to get those quality whistleblower comments. Okay. You've got to put up with the item. What about people who are quite obviously sort of going after competitors, trashing competitors, their products, their services, what they're doing on the stock exchange for competitive ben benefit? There seems to be a lot of that sort of stuff you see in the MBI comments. Uh, we're trying to be more proactive in terms of deleting comments that are just mindlessly slagging off someone. But mm. you've also, you can't patronise readers. You've got to assume that they can see a lot of comments for what they are, that it's mm. uh, someone with a, a strong degree of self-interest. Okay. More comments down here? Sorry, I'll just go to this. We'll come back to you. Cheers, Peter. Um, just two thoughts. It's on? Yes. Um, akin to the whistleblowing comment is um, people helping other people. So uh, I'm with Trade Me. Um, we have um, a large kind of uh, tradition of people identifying people that are in danger or at risk through the message boards mm. and getting help. Sometimes that can be suicide related things, mm. sometimes it can be uh, abuse, physical abuse situations and what the community bubbles up is actually quite generous and, and healthy and um, it's not quite the same as whistleblowing but it is a, a public good. The other thing that we do is um, allow the community to vote on or off yeah. or vote off uh, rather posts or threats yeah. Uh, so in a typical month, they would vote off between two and 400 threats. Sounds a hell of a lot. Then you think we get 25,000 posts a day. Yeah. So against that, it's actually relatively small. And people on those forums, are, uh, on, on the threads, are, they're debating the big stories of the day, the Ewan McDonald case, whatever. It, it, it probably gets quite heated on there. Uh, it, it absolutely does. Yeah. And um, there we, we set a threshold for how many votes to take off a post versus a whole thread. Yeah. Uh, but that self-moderation actually takes care of about 95% of it. Okay, yeah. Awesome, yeah. I'd like to thank Hannah and Michael for giving their stories because mm -hmm. I think it gives us a very, a very good perspective of the harm that um, some of us can do in terms of what someone's willing to share. But both of those stories reminded me that, um, you know, they were very akin to the sort of things we hear in terms of, you know, um, school kids getting cyberbullied, all that sort of stuff, and it did make it did make me think that I'm I'm seeing two types of behaviour here. I'm seeing the behaviour of an opinionated person having an opinion about a topic, and I'm seeing a cyberbully. Mm. So can can we solve this whole trolling? I mean, mm. you you give something life by giving it a name. So I can kill trolls here today by saying they don't exist anymore. What we have instead is we have opinionated individuals and we have cyber bullies. Yeah. And if people are opinionated individuals, then within our society, we've decided that that's an okay thing for them to be, and it's fine. And Pat David's got ways of, you know, mm. of deciding when they stop being opinionated individuals and start being cyber bullies. Mm. And, you know, if they're cyber bullies, then that is a very real social concern that we have across all levels. And we'll start to take, um, well, take that into account. So, yeah. Solve trolls, they don't exist anymore. You've got opinionated individuals and cyber bullies. Yeah. And you know, what you're saying is very interesting because ar around the world there are legislative moves to, st to, to crack the cyber bull bullies. Now, if you look at in Arizona, for instance, Arizona House Bill 2549, which recently passed both legislative houses and awaits approval by the governor there, have drafted some legislation that says. It is unlawful for any person with intent to terrify, intimidate, threaten, harass, annoy, or offend to use any electronic or digital device and use any obscene, lewd, or profane, profane language to suggest any lewd or th uh, to, to threaten to inflict in physical harm to the person or property of any person. And that, if you do that, could be a class one mis 
demeanor, which is punishable by a fine of up to two and a half thousand dollars or six months in prison. If you then go on to harass or stalk someone, it's a class three felony, up to 25 years in jail. Now this hasn't passed yet. It's very unpopular in the U.S. because of the broadness of the language, because potentially, you know, what is uh, threatening, harassing, annoying, or offensive? Um, you know, that can apply to a cyber bully. It can apply to someone who's stimulating robust discussion. So I'm interested in what people think about moves like this. And, and for instance, in, in the UK as well, where they're looking at Britain's House of Commons is debating a, a law against trolls. They want an amendment to the Defamation Act there, um, which is yet another sort of legislative move. We've got international conventions that New Zealand is looking to sign up to and potentially enact... Um, uh, provisions against hate speech. So there is this move to legislate against the, the pointy end of, of trolling, which is the cyber bullies. Do we want more of this? The sense I'm getting from people here is that w we can take care of this ourselves with our own policies, robust policies in the, in the blogging community and in the mainstream media. Look, this goes back to norms in the forum, I think, again. Sorry. Back, oh, down. back there, yeah. So um, I think it's actually more important that we educate people. I mean, that's what it comes down to. It's the education issue. Is that it's the same reason you don't make offhanded jokes about uh, disability or racial slurs in a public forum where there's a very diverse audience. Um, it's the same reason you don't use intimidating language, which is overbearing, <coughs> um, in, a, in an email post. All we can hope for is that the, the, the negative reactions from the communities of practice is going to enforce a norm of good behaviour mm. in, in these communities, okay. and, and, and hopefully the people that are, uh, it's, an, it's opinionated language, I think, more than trolling that we're talking about now. Yeah. That's good. We've made the move from talking about trolling into mm. a, a opinionated language. Um, all we can do is hope that the norms that we have in good society starts to apply to those communities of practice where we're seeing those behaviours. Sure. Uh, I was going to say something sort of similar in, in the sense that I agree that trolling is, is too limiting and loaded the term, and that we are talking about broader issues of, of kind of norms of civility and how they might kind of translate into a, into into these translate or not translate into these uh, in, into these digital contexts. I just wanted to uh, mention my own experience, which is on a on a much more sort of modest scale, but having run blogs for a number of years in in a tertiary context mm -hmm. and. Um, Having to deal with, uh, I have the advantage there of, of the communities being um, in the hundreds, but small enough that I can sort of track people down and, and, and call them in and, and, and talk to them if, if necessary. And, and in that kind of context, we, the, the strict sort of easy to define distinction between who's a bully versus who's uh, just being strongly opinionated is actually very difficult. Mm. It, it's, very, it's very blurred. Um, and quite often I just have to sort of speak to people about about their about their tone and about the way that they talk to each other, which kind of verges on belligerent towards kind of harassment. And and I mean, t just two observations. One is that uh, in in the years that I've done this, every time I've had to speak to someone, it's it you know it's it's always been someone male um, that that I've had to speak to. Um, and and that in in almost on almost every occasion, the person that I've spoken to has clearly not understood the consequences of the way that they're talking, that they clearly lack, um, lack certain kind of social literacies um, rather than having set out with an, an intent to, to, to bully or harass, even though that was the consequence. Okay. Maybe just behind you there was someone who wanted to say something. Yeah, hi. This sort of crosses over into our session uh, from yesterday, mm. bad behaviour online. Yeah. Uh, and I just remind people about the existence of the Harassment Act. Mm. Um, that particular piece of legislation actually states, and I was interested, Peter, in what you said about the Arizona legislation, mm. because I, I kind of like to have a look at that. Mm. Um, the, the Harassment Act actually says that it's recognised that comments which may seem uh, fairly innocuous to many people actually can be very hurtful to others. And there's a two-stage test that's used in the Harassment Act. It's a subjective test as a starting point. Uh, how do I feel about this particular comment? And then there's the second test, which is, well, would a reasonable person, which is the objective side, would a reasonable person in my shoes find that to be offensive? So it's already there, but yeah. what's on the horizon is what the Law Commission uh, yeah. is proposing to do as part and parcel of Justice Minister Sir, um, uh, Judith Collins. 
uh, request to fast track the cyberbullying harassment mm -hmm. side of um, of their new media um, report. Right. Peter, can I just yeah. make a comment about this, the difference between the, the legislation approach and mm. the self-regulation that we're talking about, people who are hosting uh, message boards and threads where they are making a decision about whether something um, is crossing the line into cyberbullying. My experience has been that it's all well and good if the people who are running those organisations are going to be fair-minded, but if they have the same um, approach to a view, they are not going to take down comments that that fall into that offensive category, which is where I think we need the legislation to come into it. And that's, that's been my experience, is the right. stuff I've seen on the threads that relate to the cases I've been involved in have not been about robust debate. They've been about um, direct defamation and basically slagging people off. Right. Um, and it's be the action had to be taken because the people who were hosting that site didn't think there was anything wrong with that, and that's where I prefer, would prefer if I knew there was some legislation that would be able to be come in and do this reasonably quickly, uh, rather than having to wait maybe two or three years, which is what mm. we had to go through. Interesting in what blog network or blog owners feel about this idea of um, having legislation apply to them. Um, is anyone here maybe, I don't know, David Farrar may have views on this. I know you, you submitted on the, the, um, the Law Commission's Report, but anyone else have firm views on this? Uh, Hang on, wait for the. Just wait for the uh, mic. I think legislating so that the moderators or host providers are forced to take down content is of the wrong approach. Okay. Uh, the technology available to these mm. people who are running these sites uh, allows them to circumvent the legislation. It, it, it's it'll be a paper dragon. We're going to waste time and money talking about an issue that, in effect, is not going to help the situation. And, and regardless of your opinion on whether that's a good or a bad thing, that's the reality. And legislating to make that a legal position that you can take to court is a really bad thing for lots of reasons. Because it, it, you're ending up in the Kim.com territory, effectively. A third party is hosting content. Where you, go, you, you can go down all sorts of rabbit holes. OK. Any other views on that? Actually, this is a slightly different um, mm -hmm. point. Um, so I'm moving away from it, but um, just because I've got the microphone now. <laughs> um, I'm from AUT, and I've done um, analysis of uh, computer-mediated communication right. on, um, on blog um, forums. And I think what we're missing a little bit here is the more subtle side of the effects mm. of um, strong opinions. Mm. Um, one of the um, uh, blog forums that I was analysing was actually set up specifically for minority groups. It got dominated by a very strong group of people and actually scared off the people that the forum was for. So it's not necessarily trolling, mm. but it's, it brings up the issue of really understanding what computer-mediated media, communication is all about. And I yeah. just think um, we don't really understand what we're saying when we're saying online and how it's interpreted, and that's just another aspect I wanted to bring up. Yeah, and as you know, I'll, I'll post this on Cyblogs. There's an increasing amount of research that I'm sure you're familiar with. I mentioned this study of conversations on Reddit, and the the person who did this for their thesis, they sort of concluded, I'm reminded of the Shakespearean fool, a character that invites laughs and derision, but who uses wordplay, feigned ignorance, and mockery to make insightful commentary and cause even the most intelligent characters to... Uh, themselves seem foolish. Trolling is simply a new face of this kind of behaviour, or perhaps better put, a new iteration of this kind of phenomenon, lacking a face and disguised in anonymity often. And I think we all like that sort of thing. You know, one of the things on the Cyblogs community, the best discussions we have on the Google group where we talk about issues is actually talking about the trolls and how we responded to them and justifying our position and dis discussing the actual issue. Did we do the right thing? So um, it would be a less colourful, colourful and vibrant community with, without this sort of discussion that pushes the boundaries, I think. Any, we've got about a few minutes to go. Any final uh, uh, comments, anecdotes about trolling? Yeah, and um, I'm Andrew Schick. Probably my, um, my first kind of um, getting into this was when I did something slightly dodgy called Global Mode with a, with a company called Fix. Um, <laughs> right. And what I, what I found there was that there was very, very different, I guess, flavours um, 
that came out from blogs, um, just different discussions, different um, discussion boards and those sorts of things. And there was, a, there was a real difference between the likes of NBR and the comments that were coming out of there, mm. um, Computer World, GP Forums, Geek Zone, and those sorts of things. And it, I guess it comes down to, for me, what someone owns all of these, or owns these websites. They're created for a reason. Often it's monetary. Um, and, you know, I, I put the question out there, is, isn't it up to them to be directing and not, not necessarily controlling, but at least directing the, the flavour of what their website is created for. Mm. So you get some that are 90% negative, mm -hmm. and it makes um, marketing managers, I guess like myself, probably less likely to want to engage in those types of um, areas than you know, the one that I, um, that, that I see as, as very helpful and uplifting. And, and contributing to, um, to the industry is, is Geeks. Yeah, they Geeks actually in. do a very good job of, yeah. of kind of raising that level of discussion and therefore getting uh, brand managers, um, managers inside of bigger organisations willing to actually discuss, listen to a community and take action on a technology side of things. Um, you know, so from a, from a control point of view or an influence point of view, the way that we treat trolls mm. um, or you know, bullies and, and people who just have strong opinions, I think very much determines the flavour and therefore the usefulness of a lot of these blogs in the first place. Mm, interesting. Any other views on that? That's well, it's, several. It's not exactly a view on that, but uh, the, the alignment between this and the cyberbullying mm. uh, session yesterday, I think, is a, is a very strong one because, uh, firstly, let's remind ourselves that perhaps even in this room today, trolling has occurred. Perhaps people have gone off topic on subjects of interest to themselves <laughs> that don't quite fit in. Um, so again, this is this is not not novel. It's uh, it's just something that tends to happen when collections get together. The internet, of course, with its persistence and its reach, has perhaps changed um, qualitatively as a result of the quantity of exposure that can occur. And just while we're dipping back into uh, Usenet history for the origins of the word troll. Mm. Um, I remember an Usenet group called Alt.Tasteless. <laughs> and I think there might be a few people here who do, because it was pretty memorable. And in fact, the, the norms, which are what generally control these sort of activities, were the complete inverse of what's being discussed here. A post that wasn't offensive or tasteless would be derided and would often get uh, responses that added some element of tastelessness to whatever had been put in. And that's where I think you know, the breadth of all of this is another, another point. Um, what David Farrer does on David Farrer's blog is nobody's business, in my opinion, except David Farrer. Mm. He can make it out tasteless if he wants to. I don't have to go there. It's not one of a limited number of channels that is essential to my existence. And so a choice can be made. Mm. But then we get into the, the, the whales of this environment, and that's where you start talking about uh, Facebook and 600 million yeah. people and how you, how you control that. And I, I think in the end, as I recall from the uh, SMTP RFC, the user has an extraordinary level of control yeah. about how things appear in their mailbox. Mm. So if there's stuff that you don't want to see, there's a chance for you to not see it. There's blocks, there's all kinds of things that can be done there. Now, I, I appreciate, uh, even in the Internet NZ members list, there are concerns about the level of belligerence and aggression that might be dissuading some people from expressing an opinion. I'm just not sure how innocuous we can make mm. human debate so that nobody is ever concerned about uh, about the reaction to what they say. And I guess that then goes back to Judge Harvey's reference to the Harassment Act, yeah. that you know, what is the reasonable person going to think? Good comment. Any other final comments? Yep. Yeah, I think, I think Hamish and Judge Harvey have, have really um, touched on the, the um, need for people to to keep in mind the subjective as well as objective measures here. Mm. And, you know, when someone's saying something, try and, try and think about what the receiver 
is is going <laughs> to um uh, I'm taking it. We've I'm seeing a couple of things on the on Flickr here about um about, you know <laughs> offensive to whom you yeah, know offensive. Yeah. It's it's going to always some part of that measure is going to be offensive to the person receiving the comment, but then you can meter that against the objective view of of, of the rest of the, of the community. So I think that's important to remember. Yeah. Okay. Anything to wrap up? Any final comments or observations? Does anyone sort of have a a site on the web in mind that is just toxic to go to because of the commenting policies of that site? Is it, does anyone want to name any names? Sorry, what's that? <laughs> okay. MBR. MBR, yeah, you find it toxic? <laughs> and obviously no one reads the comments on YouTube, which is interesting because there's a lot of comments on YouTube and you can't even now block them all out, right? So... Um, but what about, you know, the, uh, it's the whales, I think, is, is, the, is the important one. The, the Facebook, as I said, Campbell Live, um, close up, are interacting on a, on a massive scale with viewers on these forums. Are the tools good enough on the likes of Facebook to moderate, to strip out troll-like comments? Uh, do we need to get more sophisticated on these big platforms about the tools available to do that? Any final comments or questions, even from more technically-minded people about what's available in those forums? What about even on the stuff in the Herald Online? Are they good enough about moderating? I mean, I know the Herald delays. There's quite a lag sometimes on comments on the Herald, so um, some people don't like that, but they're taking a time to filter through them. Is, the, is it the same for stuff? Does anyone read the comments on any of these sites? Is it just, is it just too toxic to... What's the historical significance of all these comments? Will we look back in years? Will sociologists and psychologists pour through them to try and get a glimpse into what we were like in the early part of the millennium? <laughs> I don't know. Hey, but thank you so much for all your comments. It's been really good. It's been some good stuff on Twitter as well. Get along to Cyblogs. I'm going to put up all those studies that I can find as I troll the literature uh, around trolling in particular. There's actually quite a body of it now. So thanks very much for your time and attention. Uh, this